great opportunity to speak to you. Um, like you've heard, my name is Pendo Galukande, and I'm a couple, marriage, and family therapist. Uh, some people prefer to say counselor. When you say therapist, it's apparently very threatening. Anyways, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, some of you are too young to know that some years back, not too long ago, we didn't have the integration of faith and knowledge. Uh, those who pursued the life of faith rejected knowledge, and those who pursued the life of knowledge rejected faith, and these things were divorced. And when UCU was started, I was delighted. I was delighted because those two things are part of my life, uh, seeking knowledge and seeking God. And we can have faith and reason together. So you're very privileged. You're among the first and few people that get to integrate what you believe and what you will do professionally in the world. So thank you so much, leadership, for having me. I am very, very delighted. Um, I've been invited to speak on the topic uh, dealing with love, starvation, and rejection. And it's no secret that we lost some precious souls in this community not too long ago to love-related, romantic relationship uh, entanglements. And we don't want to lose any more young souls. Now, I study intimate relationships. So you, you study counseling and specialize in intimate relationships and what happens between a man and a woman. And even the Bible says it's a mystery. It is a mystery. But there are some things that God has revealed to us, and it would be really wrong of me to sit here in this country and keep this information to myself. Um, I feel like I have a very urgent message to share about what has been understood about the, the life of a man and a woman when they love each other. What happens? Why can something so beautiful end up leading to someone taking not only their life, but the life of another person. What is it that turns that thing into something sour and maybe something even dangerous? So I'm going to try and give you an overview. We can't get into too much detail, but it will give you hope. I'm hoping that I will, uh, it's a message of hope pointing us back to God. Um, so, next slide, please. I'm just going to, to, just to ensure that I stay on track because I can waffle. <laughs> I'll give us a map so you can hold me accountable. So I've finished the introduction of myself and why we are doing this topic. Um, and, and then we'll go into scripture, the scripture that um, Reverend Mariam uh, just read to us. And I'll just highlight a few things of that scripture because I think that God has spoken to any and every situation you will find yourself in. I, I have three fields of study, zoology, management, and psychology, and I haven't found anything that they have discovered that beats God's knowledge. Like when we study management and get to the very top and then they find this theory you'll find that there's a parallel in the Bible. This is, again, not to say that you throw away knowledge, but um, this knowledge in, in the professions, they expound what's in the Bible. They give you the detail so that you can actually make life decisions. So I'll move from scripture and get into the anatomy of love, which is like a little psychology lesson. To be honest, I think psychology should be taught in schools from the time that we are babies because it so determines how life is going to happen. And so I would like to even encourage the leadership here to consider, just like they've integrated um, worldview courses for all of you, to integrate some psychology. Everybody needs to have some psychology, understanding how the mind works. And then we'll, we'll, after sharing the, the bad news of the anatomy of love, <laughs> the bad news of how love goes sour, I would like to share some remedies. What can you do? And um, 
I thought there was going to be an invitation to have ministry time, but I've been told that is going to happen later. So you know about Wednesday, if you want prayer, you can go to the chaplain, see there's a ministry team, but also on Wednesdays you can come here for prayer. And um, you also have a counseling department that's well equipped, so you can go there. So I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. And this here, a uh, couple of, of verses, uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4 is dense. You can preach for an entire afternoon on these two uh, verses. So I'm not going to, to pretend like I'm going to do it justice. I'm going to just pick out three points. So it, it reads that everything we could ever need, everything that we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine divine power. For all this has lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him, of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price so that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature, partnership with the divine nature, by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. So I'm just going to pick out three little things that you have been given everything, we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness that we have been given magnificent promises and we have been called to experience the partnership with God of his divine nature. We as Christians are different from those who don't believe, those who think we are only flesh and blood. We actually believe that we are in two dimensions, that we are here in a physical world, but we are also alive in a spiritual world. Why is this important? When you have students or you know, human beings that get to a point of, of taking their lives, that's a very sad thing. I want you to feel that sadness. It's a very sad thing. You get to the point, they, they've gotten to the point where they think there is no solution. There is no way out. I'm up against the wall. The only thing is to take my life. But this scripture, sorry, you're far ahead of me, whoever is in the <laughs> control room. This scripture, I'm still in the scripture behind that slider, is telling us that we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness, and that we have partnership with God in his divine nature. So the, the choir sang something about um, the love is too macho, you know? The love is too macho. But the truth is, sometimes we are living divorced from that love. Sometimes we are living separate from that love. We are not experiencing it. We sing about it in chapel, but we don't know how to, it's not our lived experience. I have found that counseling helps people to access the tremendous promises, the blessings, that deposit of divinity that is in you. The truth is when you come to counseling, I'm not going to put any medicine in you, the psychiatrists do that. I'm not going to, you know, to put anything inside of you. I'm only going to help you access what is already inside of you. And that is why I say psychology is important. So much good is inside of you. So much joy, so much love. But the truth is we hardly access even a small part. Look at this university. It was an idea in someone's mind. Now, if each one of us chose to to fully utilize what is in their minds, imagine how many things could come out. But we only use a tiny, I don't even think 10%, a tiny, tiny part of our brain. But that's not the topic of today. The topic is love, starvation, and rejection. How do we get there? How does the love of a man and a woman come to this? But if you were to take away one thing, just know that 
Next slide, please. His divine power gives us everything we need. That if you just stop and say, there is a solution. In every moment, you have everything you need. You just need to wake up to that, to wake up to that truth as a Christian, believing scripture. I have everything I need. The, a solution is going to come. It's coming my way. Just be patient. I pray that no one that is sitting under my voice today will take their life because of uh, being rejected. Never again. Never, ever, ever again. So, next slide, please. The, the anatomy of love. I'm going to tell you a little story because humans love stories. And when you tell stories, we retain more. So, this idea, this mystery of love started by a man called John Bowlby, and he studied children, children and their mothers. Um, he was born a long time ago, he's British, in an aristocratic family, rich family, where the children don't have a lot of contact time with their parents, and they're raised by a governess. So a governess is responsible for your education, for your balanced diet, for your exercise, you know, all those types of things. Um, I'm sure there are some uh, families that live like that, even here in Uganda. Um, and so he was raised by a governess, but at the age of seven, the governess was sent away, and John Bowlby was sent to boarding school. And he was bereft. It was he'd lost a mother, you know, because when you're little and you've grown up with this person for seven years, you look at her as a mother. And she was sent away, and he, he felt that longing, that just that, that loss, that bereavement, like almost like she died. And it affected him so much, but the parents didn't understand this. Anyway, he's sent away to boarding school. Fast forward, years later, he becomes a medical doctor. Fast forward, he gets into psychology. He becomes a psychoanalyst. And he starts to observe children in British hospitals. So there, there was a limit to how much uh, contact time children that were hospitalized had with their parents. Because at that stage, they had understood germs. Again, knowledge had helped us. God had provided that knowledge. It wasn't witchcraft. People are not dying of witchcraft. They are dying by contagion, you know, contagious diseases. And so they said, no, 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 when, while your child is here in hospital, you can come and stand at a distance and see the child. Don't hold them, don't touch them, because you might give them diseases. And John Bowlby felt like, this is wrong, because there was the memory of that heartache within him. And he started to do studies where he allowed children contact time, and some children were not allowed contact time. And it was amazing that those who had contact with their parents during their hospitalization actually thrived. They did better, their fevers went down, their wounds healed, and they were discharged. So contrary to the thought that contact would make them sicker, actually contact made them better. And he carried out several studies like that, and while he was working with the World Health Organization, he came up with this attachment theory, which is basically an idea about the invisible bonds that hold us together as humans. We are created needing to bond with another human. So, uh, these are the six tenets of the initial theory. He said, children are pre-programmed to bond. And I think this is accessible information. If you've seen a little baby, usually if you put your, your finger near a newborn, what will they do? They'll cling. They'll cling. They are, they are, we are created to bond, to hold on to another. Um, and the bonding is thought to provide three things, comfort, care, and pleasure. The child is looking for those things. And the child seeks proximity. We want to be near the loved one. We want to be near the caregiver. And so if, you, if the child wakes up and they're alone in the room, what are they going to do? They're going to cry. And what will the cry do? <laughs> it will bring mommy running, you know? 
or daddy or, or whoever they have, whoever else. I'll tell you that I took my, our son when he was maybe six years. We went going to an orphanage to see kids in the orphanage. And I, I was trying to help him understand children that are in an orphanage. And so we said, these children, they have no mommy and they have no daddy. And at that time, we had a maid called Abwoli. And he said, what about their Abwoli, you know? <laughs> Where, where is there a Wally? Anyway, just to show that uh, he, he, you know, children think like that. But where was I? Proximity seeking. Somebody always comes when the child cries. Uh, so even that time, they don't have a lot of power, but they have the power to cry and get proximity. Also, that this person is a primary base for exploration, um, that children will explore the world if they know that you are there to come back to. And if they're out in the world and they're threatened, they, they will come back, safe haven. If they run and there's a dog there, the child comes back to the mother. And lastly, that if they separate from this primary caregiver, there's going to be distress. And that this whole mechanism is a mechanism for survival. That is the theory. This is the uh, a theory is simply an explanation of the natural world, how things relate together. So this is the theory um, that John Bowlby suggested. And what happened is, next slide please, is this theory was then taken by other scientists to see is it true? Can we create experiments to prove this? I'm sorry that that is so small, you probably can't see it, but I hope I'll explain it very well. My son says I explain very well. So. I hope you're following. Are you following? <laughs> okay, great. So a lady called Mary Ainsworth took this theory and came here to Uganda. I'm so proud that the research started here, somewhere in Molago, and conducted a, an experiment where they were taking children 18 months and younger and putting them in a room with a mother and a stranger and carrying out various iterations, baby with stranger, baby with mother. But the main part is that the mother and child at some point were separated. Now, when they were separated, all the children, there was no exception, all were distressed. They expressed some sort of distress. However, when they were reunited, there were only three different types of behavior that the scientists could observe. The first one, the mother walks in, the child runs to them, and the mother holds the child, and the child is soothed easily and goes back to a state of calm, and later goes back to play with toys. The sec and so those were called securely attached children. They had a secure emotional bond. And then there were those who, the mother walks in, the child runs to the mother, the mother picks them up, but they're unable to draw any comfort from the mother. They remain in a state of distress. They're, and so they were called anxious or ambivalent. It's like you have come to the mother, but you're not drawing out the comfort. And then there was a third lot who they would, the mother would walk in and they behaved aloof. If they came to the mother, they didn't really raise their hands. It was the mother who had to reach out for them. Or if they raised their hands, they refused to give eye contact to the mother. They kept turning away. And soon, they would act as if they're avoiding the mother, as if they're aloof. And then years later, a fourth, um, a fourth pattern was, was observed. Kids who had a little, sorry, that last group was called the avoidant. And just like the word avoidant means in English, it's the same in science. And they, uh, the last group then that was discovered some years later was a mix of avoidant and anxious. Some kids come, then they flop down. Then they pick you, you pick them up, and then they push you away, you know, and it was mixed. And these were called disorganized or disordered attachment. So what the next thing that happened is that these children were studied longit in longitudinal studies, meaning they were studied for years into adulthood. And guess what they found? That most of us keep the attachment style of our childhood into adulthood. So you're all sitting here, and you have an attachment style. And you don't, maybe you don't even know about it. So 
The secure were found to be secure. They were mostly peaceful adults, calm, within relationship. And within a relationship, they know how to ask for their needs to be met. I know now you're already trying to think, which one am I? And then the anxious became anxious preoccupied um, because in adulthood they found that these people have obsessive thoughts about their loved, their love interest. Like the whole day they're thinking about their love interest. And these tend to exhibit clingy uh, behavior and when they're asking for their needs to be met, it's more of a, an angry protest. You didn't call me, you didn't text, you know? Have you seen that behavior before? Yeah, maybe you even exhibit that, that behavior. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You probably have an anxious attachment. And then the avoidant are the ones who seem distant. They have difficulty sharing their needs. Uh, they are mistrustful. And in adulthood, they are called dismissive avoidant because that they tend to dismiss Em their own emotional experience and also dismiss the emotional experience of another person and they seem aloof and cold. And lastly, the disorganized attachment are now in adulthood called fearful avoidant because they fear um, to get involved in relationship, they fear closeness and they are most, the most um, main feature of this attachment style is that they're hot, cold, hot, cold, and they don't seem to have a strategy of getting their needs met. Um, yeah, let me pause there. It is thought that how you are parented has a lot to do with your attachment style. So it's thought that if you didn't receive consistent emotional nurturing, Consistent. You may have got an emotional nurturing, but inconsistent. Maybe you got it from one parent and not the other. Or in some cases, the parenting was abusive. Then you know, that's where you get the disorganized attachment. So we come out of childhood with an internal woundedness. It cannot be seen with the naked eye. It's not a wound that you can point at, but it's there. And that's why I'm saying it's very important for a university like this that we have this access to this knowledge. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity because now you will know more when you observe relationships. So the secure person doesn't really have any significant woundedness. They have internal security, a sense of feeling safe in their body and safe with other people. The anxious people have a fear of abandonment. You didn't call me. Are you dead? Are you alive? You know, I didn't know where you were. Anxiety, that is the main marker. Don't laugh, it's, this is a real thing. <laughs> the avoidant has a fear of being engulfed. Don't call me, I'll call you. Huh? Fear of being engulfed by a relationship. And, but even underlying this, it masks a fear of abandonment. So all the different styles have a fear of abandonment, but the fear of abandonment in the avoidance is not so prominent. It doesn't show up easily. And then the disorganized people fear closeness and fear being trapped in a relationship, but they also fear rejection. Remember we talked about rejection? That there's some instability inside and they fear rejection. Rejection is a no-no because they've gone through some trauma in childhood and when you say, no, you can't be my boyfriend, no, not now, I want to focus on my studies, they receive a totally different message. It is life or death, you know, I am being left to die. Because in our brains, um, attachment is coded as a matter of life and death. I can't get into that, but Simba Wakati, I've written a book called Demystifying the Drama of Marriage. It's over there, it's 40,000 shillings, and it has more detail on this. So I'm giving you an overview, but there's more that you can find out. Now in conflict, it's really important that I highlight this, even as I see our time is going. In conflict, the secure people can deal with difficult issues without losing composure. Um, they can talk about difficult things. The anxious people can be aggressive and hostile. The avoidant tend to put walls up, leave it alone, they may not talk about the issue. The disorganized 
can be self-harming and or abusive. So if you've seen self-harm, suicidality around that, most likely it is a disorganized attachment. Most likely it's a fearful, avoidant attachment. Now, in addition to these um, insecure attachment styles, the three insecure attachment styles, the anxious, the avoidant, and the fearful avoidant, there are a section of us that become addicted to love. Addicted to love and sex, but I'm not going to talk about sex for now. Um, addicted to love. And there are symptoms of love addiction. The symptom, one of the biggest symptoms, is an unhealthy fixation with the partner. So that there are these obsessive compulsive behaviors. You're stalking the person. What are they doing now? Are they on WhatsApp? When did they last check their WhatsApp? How come they haven't replied my text? A fixation, an obsession. Those are signs of some degree of unhealthy um, love relationship. They become depressed and obsessed with their love interest when their advances are not reciprocated. It becomes a huge problem. They find it very difficult to leave unhealthy or toxic relationships. And they may make poor decisions because of emotions that they have towards their partner. They, they may quit their job easily, um, cut an exam, cut a class because they needed to go and check on their loved one or that type of thing. So as friend groups, as a community, I think that we should make partnerships right now uh, in this, when we are still sober, to say that, hey, if you see me going off the rails, please tell me, you know? As a friend group, you sit down and say, look, let's agree that if one of us gets into a toxic relationship, that we are going to be able to point that out early so that a person can get themselves out or get help, can go to counseling or go to chaplaincy or go to someone to help. So these are red flags. Again, let me just highlight them. If you see an unhealthy fixation, if you see depression combined with that obsession, if you find a person is in a toxic relationship, they're being controlled, there's nothing good coming out, and they're not leaving, and also if you find they're making erratic decisions, those are red flags. Please tell somebody else. But also for suicidality, and suicide month is coming up, and I hope there'll be a chance for you guys to um, look at the signs of suicide. It's very important that someone gets to know, and if possible, the person is hospitalized, taken into inpatient care. So what are the remedies, uh, very quickly? The first remedy is acknowledging. Acknowledge your woundedness. We're here laughing, but the truth is, each one of us has some degree of brokenness. There is no one who comes out of childhood perfect, with perfect security. We all have some degree of security and some degree of insecurity. It just is, the difference is in amounts, you know? So agree, acknowledge which type of woundedness, even now as I speak, acknowledge it. But not only that, acknowledge it to somebody else. Once you, you know, the Bible says, confess to one another and pray for one another. When we open up and share with another person, it's like you are, inviting um, inviting help, inviting solutions and all that. When we keep secrets, secrets are very damaging to us. Um, and, and then secondly, invite God in. Invite God into that space. Let's not have a God who is in chapel, who is on Thursday at lunchtime, but a God who has no impact on our emotions, a God who you know, has no connection with the rest of your life. Uh, thirdly, let's grow knowledge. Let us grow our knowledge. Even in that scripture, it talks about accessing these divine promises through knowledge. You know, so grow knowledge. Read my book. Read other books. Get onto you know the internet. There's a lot of good stuff there. Grow your knowledge about your insecure attachment. Um, Fourthly, I would say seek therapy. You guys have therapists here. I believe it's free of charge. Please do not waste the opportunity. Each one of us can benefit from some therapy to heal those wounds. And lastly, I'd just like to bring us back to our scripture. Everything we could ever need 
for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. I want to remind you, it is so easy to forget that we live in a spiritual dimension as well as the physical. I want to remind you that the God we serve, the God we love, is a God of healing. Look, the ozone layer I hear repairs itself. When you get a cut, in a few days you find that it heals. If the body can heal itself, how much more the emotions, how much more the mind? God has created us in a way that we heal. Counseling is going to help you some, Prayer is going to help you some. Hanging out with good friends, not toxic friends, is going to help you some. So these are all things that God has provided. He's provided everything we need for life and godliness. Has already been deposited inside of us. So that's my encouragement to you. Thank you very much.